easy explain the philosophy of Anne Conway. To start off, just going to go over a very brief overview of her life and works. So she was born Anne Finch in England in 1631. And when she was 20, she married Edward Conway, the Earl of Conway. And thus she took the name Lady Anne Conway. And that's how she is now remembered and known and, and tied to her work. Uh, in 1679, Lady Anne Conway passed away. And it wasn't until 1690 that her most famous work, Principles of the Most Ancient and Modern Philosophy, was published posthumously. So just a little bit on this work, on Conway's principles. This work is largely coming from the point of criticism. It's a critique against some of the most popular modern philosophies of her time, those of Descartes, Hobbes, and Spinoza. And how does she critique them? She comes from this place of the Lurianic Kabbalah, and that's an ancient Hebrew text, and also the tenets of her Quakerism. Lady Anne Conway had converted to Quakerism, uh, and she's using these tenets, these belief systems, belief systems as her supporting arguments against these three major philosophies. Um, so yes, it's a critique, but also throughout the chapters of her principles, Lady Anne Conway does construct her own very unique individual philosophy as well, a uh, feminist one of the time, which was not too common. And just to give you an idea of what's contained in these pages, I did give a brief outline of the nine chapters and the topics and themes that are in there. She does have a name for the first one. It's God and His Divine Attributes. Um, but I got these themes from the chapters themselves and also from an audiobook I was listening to where the narrator uh, gave, some, gave some suggestions for what these chapters could be called as well. Uh, so I hope those give you an idea of what she's actually choosing to write about. But I wanted to focus on how I think Conway is actually way ahead of her time when it comes to some of the ideas she had in the STEM fields and the sciences, uh, largely in three main ways. Uh, the first one is endosymbiotic theory. And if you don't know what that is, that's in modern biology. And it's a theory of how chloroplasts and uh, mitochondria, they used to be their own independent little tiny sim simple cells. And at one point, they came to live inside of our cells. And our cells didn't attack them. They didn't break them down. They saw benefit from how much energy, the energy they produced. So they started living together, so closely together that one was inside the other, hence the endo. And it's symbiosis, right? It's living together. There's mutual benefit. So it's endosymbiotic theory. And this is a very modern theory. But all the way back in the 1660s, 1670s, when, Cavendish was, uh, when Conway was writing, uh, we'll see a couple ways that she really pointed out um, the precursors of endosymbiotic theory. So in Conway's chapter 3, section 5, she says the smallest creature of which we can conceive has infinite creatures in itself. Uh, she also goes on in chapter 7, section 4, to say, indeed, one creature can touch another, but not be present in all its parts. But a smaller body can be in a larger, and a more subtle body in a grosser. So in, this one is really painting the picture of what we're actually seeing occurring in endosymbiotic theory, that mitochondria and chloroplasts are living inside of animal and plant cells. So that's the first way I think Conway was really ahead of her time. The second way is actually in physics, and it's with the theory of quantum entanglement. And this theory was actually made really popular with the 2014 movie Interstellar. But basically, this theory holds in physics that after two particles uh, come together and interact, they're always going to be linked to each other in some way, that they can even react to changes induced to each other, even when they're separated by light years worth of, of distance. And Cavendish gets into this a bit, also in her chapter 7, section 4. Uh, it's a bit of a longer passage, but I do think it is important here. And I broke it up into some, some chunks, some different parts. So Conway says, There is a certain union of parts, even when separated a certain distance from each other. Likewise, individuals of the same species, or which have an affinity in some species, have a special unity among each other, even though they are distant from each other. This is even more evident in the case of human beings. For if two people love each other very much... They are so closely united by this love that no distance can divide or separate them, for they are present to each other in spirit, and a continual flux or emanation of spirit passes from one to the other, by means of which they are united and tied together as if by ropes. Thus, whatever someone loves is united with him, and his spirit goes out into it. So Conway is definitely getting a little spiritual here. We're not going to get into her spiritual theory at this time. But she doesn't have the full means of explaining this at the physical level that we know today. But again, definitely a, a second way that Conway is really uh, ahead of the times, of her times, when it comes to STEM and her understanding of the sciences. The third way that Conway is ahead is when it comes to a modern ecological theory uh, about the biogeochemical cycles and energy flow. Um, and this really was popularized in the 1700s, 1800s. But these are basically the water cycle, the carbon cycle, food chains and food webs. 
the big theory of how matter and energy is changing and transferring uh, its states and flowing throughout Earth and the living things around Earth. And Conway got into this a little bit as well. If we look at chapter 9, section 5, Conway says, There are transmutations of all creatures from one species to another, as from stone to earth, from earth to grass, from grass to sheep, from sheep to human flesh, from human flesh to the lowest spirits of man, and from these to the noblest spirits. So again, she takes us a little bit step farther. I'm not going to quite get into her you know, more metaphysical theory today, but... I do think that these three show how Lady Anne Conway was really a pioneer when it came to, you know, just thought in STEM and the sciences. Um, for now, I hope this helps.